Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, science fans of all ages. Welcome to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's CMNH at home. As you can see, I am such a fan of our science programming, I swiped the sign off the wall from my video conference studios and brought it home with me. Not only am I home today, my name's Lee, I'm in charge of video conferencing programs at the museum, but our show director, Matt Crow, is making all this possible, and Sam, uh, our fabulous social media guru. Also at home is our scientist of the day. It's Scientist Saturdays. Let's find out who we're talking to today. Dr. Gunter, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, I'm Dr. Nicole Gunter. I am the Inverter, uh, Associate Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So invertebrates, that's everything without a backbone or a spine. Um, and in the museum, we're mainly an entomology collection, so an insect collection, but we also have mollusks and other invertebrates. Well, that's true. I, I haven't met very many mollusks with a spine. Associate Curator of Invertebrate Zoology. That is a mouthful, man. Let's condense that down. That means you like things with six legs or more, don't you? <laughs> I sure do. I especially <laughs> love beetles. Oh, that's right. And we're talking about some really cool beetles today. Now, in the in the shutdown of the of the building where we can't access our normal research areas and my studios and such. I know that a lot of the scientists are still doing work from home, and I'm wondering if you are managing to do that as well. Yes, I am. So it's almost business as normal uh, working from home for me at the moment. I'm doing um, things like writing some of my research papers. I'm describing some new species of Australian dung beetles at the moment. Um, but not only that, because this is a really important historical moment for us, I thought it would be important to add some new insects to our collection. So myself and the digitization assistant, Haley Majeski, we actually, before shutdown, decided that we would have a little competition to see who could collect the most insects in our backyards using a really passive method of trapping called yellow pan trapping. Essentially, we use these yellow plastic bowls and a lot of flying insects are attracted to this color. Um, so we fill it with water and a drop of detergent to break the water tension. And a lot of flying insects like bees, wasps and also flies will land in the bowl where we can collect them. So next to me, I have some examples of some of the specimens that we've collected that will end up in the collection. So this was one of those beautiful warm days last week. I think it's the 8th of April. It's got a little tag in there. And you can see there's probably about 30 or 40 insects in there. But that was an amazing day. Most, most days we've just been getting one or two flies. Um, but it's really neat that there'll be an accession specifically to do with this shutdown and work from home. And that's going to get reflected in your records, too, because whenever you collect a specimen, you're always careful to document where it was and the circumstances where you collected it, correct? Yes, that's correct. So in each of those little vials, it will have the date that it was collected, how many hours and what those exact hours that the trap was set out, um, where it was collected. So these ones are from my backyard here. Um, and they'll all get printed on a teeny tiny little label. And we use size four font. So you can imagine how small that is. Uh, and those labels are as important as the specimens themselves. So when they all get prepared, they'll end up in our collection. We'll curate them. So we'll try and identify them down to species and then we'll put them away into the collection with their close relatives. Uh, and eventually we've been doing this project called digitizing the collection where all of that data is eventually made public and it gets shared online on databases. That's one of the coolest things that the museum does is makes their research accessible to all other scientists. I love it. And I'm kind of proud because I contributed to the entomology collection. Now this wasn't during uh, the current quarantine. This was, oh, I don't know, two or three, I can't remember now, years ago, but I went home to visit my father's place out in Ashtabula County and you're using a yellow pan his bathtub is basically the biggest depository of dead insects in his, in his house. And I went home one time and I found this little tiny creature in my dad's bathtub. 
and it looked like a tiny little, almost like a crayfish. I used to catch those when I was a kid, and I so carefully brought it home. And I think uh, show director Matt actually has a picture of this tiny little creature. And uh, Dr. Nicole, could you explain what that little creature was that I found in my dad's bathtub? This is a tiny little pseudo scorpion. So it's got those cool little neat little claws like you thought um, could be a crayfish, but it's not a crayfish at all. It's a, it's a, a little arachnid. Um, so very neat. This, you gave me the coordinates and the date that you collected this. So it also now has a label and is in our collection. I love it. That's very exciting to me. Now, the liquid that that little guy is sitting in was some Purell because that's all I had at my house at that point was a little bit of hand sanitizer. What's the liquid you had, that little vial with the blue cap, the, the, the insects you've captured? What's in there? So these are preserved in um, a high concentration of ethanol. It's an alcohol. And we just use this because it preserves not only the insect but also the DNA um, eventually all of these insects will be pinned though, and they'll be dried out and into our collection. I love it. I love it. Well, speaking of the collections, that's what we're here to discuss is your specific research. So I think, uh, show director, Matt, it's time for us to roll our video and learn more about Dr. Nicole Gunter. Hi, I'm Dr. Nicole Gunter, the associate curator of vertebrate zoology here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. My research has taken me all around the globe to advance our understanding of dung beetles. Yes, dung beetles. Most people think the biology of dung beetles is gross, but I think it's fascinating. Dung is abundant in nature and underutilized, so it's the perfect readily available food source. Also, by using dung for breeding, the beetles can provide their larvae with all the food and safety they need to survive. It's this really unique evolutionary biology that have made dung beetles so incredibly successful. And how do we know this? When people hear about my research, they think I'm out in the field picking through poop, but that's not always the case. Entomologists like myself conduct field work to collect and find dung beetles. I use pitfall traps to capture them. Dung beetles have a strong sense of smell, so I place a small bait to lure them from the surroundings into the trap. Attracting the beetles is all about choosing the right bait, and there's plenty to choose from. Sometimes I'll even make my own. I then use the collected specimens to conduct my research. I've always been interested in the evolution of dung beetles, particularly when they originated and how they diversified. Some researchers think that because almost all dung beetles feed on mammal dung, they must have evolved with mammals in the Cenozoic period, approximately 50 to 60 million years ago. Others noticed biogeographical patterns that suggest dung beetles evolved in the Cretaceous prior to the breakup of the southern supercontinent Gondwana land, at least 90 million years ago. My research sets out to address this mismatch in timing. Using DNA sequences from dung beetles and other closely related scarabs, I created a phylogenetic tree of their relationships. I then used known fossils to calibrate the tree and investigate the origins and diversifications of dung beetles. The results supported the older Cretaceous age of them, long before the major mammal diversification. So if dung beetles weren't feeding on mammal poop in the Cretaceous, what were they feeding on? Probably dinosaur dung. My research showed that dung beetles seemed to evolve approximately 110 million years ago, in line with the major radiation of angiosperms, or flowering plants. It's likely at this time, dinosaurs began to eat some of these less fibrous, more nutritious leaves of the angiosperm, which in turn would have changed the consistency of dinosaur dung, just enough to allow dung beetles to feed on it. Sounds appetizing, right? It's time to dump the stigma, pun intended. I absolutely love the last line that you use in that video, dump the stigma, because it's a double pun. And folks who are into botany probably know that the stigma is part of a flowering plant. And uh, bouncing off of that, Dr. Nicole, I have this specimen that I brought home from the museum to teach other programs, but realized, ooh, this is something that fits right into our, our interview today. 
That, my friends, is a coprolite. And I do believe this one is from the batch that is somewhere in the zone of 67 million years old or so. Coprolite, well, actually, I'll let Dr. Nicole explain what it is. Why would I have this, Dr. Nicole? So a coprolite is, well, they're my favorite fossils, um, but it's fossilized <laughs> dung or poop. Uh, so this one, I think, is from a uh, fossilized dinosaur poop. And what's really, really cool is that there are some coprolites that fossils that have some tunnels that are also observed in them. And those tunnels have been attributed to perhaps being built by dung beetles. Um, so really, really cool that there is potential evidence uh, that it links dinosaurs and dung beetles. But of course, you can imagine how difficult it is to guess who made a tunnel. So we also do have other fossils like preserved in amber that you can definitely con confirm the minimum age of dung beetles. Sure. Who made, who made the tunnel and who made the poo in the first place? I mean, it's all a great big mystery. I love it. That's a huge part of, of research is solving mysteries. Well, let's stick with that concept for a moment because when the dung beetles scoop up the poo and they roll it, they don't just leave it on the Earth's surface. They bury it for their larva to live in. And when they do that, isn't that contributing to overall soil health and the habitat? Yes, yeah, so I would say that dung beetles are some of the most underappreciated animals on the planet for their ecosystem services that they provide. So they're really, really important in nutrient cycling. If it wasn't for dung beetles and other members of the cleanup crew, you can imagine how much poop would be around in nature. But the other really cool thing about dung beetle biology is they use it not only to feed, but also to breed. So there are different types of dung beetles. Some of them are the rollers, so like the ones that you'd see on the Discovery Channel that collect that ball and roll it away where they'll make it a nest. And there is another group called the tunnelers that will build a tunnel directly under that dung source. So both of the groups, they'll collect some dung to raise their eggs and they roll it into what we call a brood ball. And in those balls, they'll lay a single egg each. That egg uh, develops into the larvae. The larvae grows, pupates, and eventually will emerge as the adult. But those tunnels, you can imagine how it can increase soil aeration. Um, so that just general process of digging in the dirt but not only that, some of that leftover dung that is buried in the, those tunnels, it's literally fertilizing that soil. So the activity and bi breeding biology of dung beetles improves soil quality through in increased aeration, uh, which in, at the same time improves soil retention uh, and also just that fertilization. So really, really cool. Without dung beetles, we wouldn't have as healthy soils. The sign that uh, show director Matt was tossing up there that said the, the dung, there you go, the dung beetles have the right of way. I found a few of those pictures from some uh, tourism sites in South Africa. And I just think that's delightful that their community is, 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 is acknowledging that these beetles are such a huge part of the environment there. It's fantastic. Now, Dr. Nicole, there's another, that's a good one, Matt. <laughs> I love it. And they do have the right of way, dog on it. Don't squish the dung beetles. Uh, Dr. Nicole, that video that we watched, that was made a few years ago. Have there been any major changes in your field of research or what you're up to uh, since that video was made? So that video was made for our temporary pop-up exhibit, Dung Beetles, which, of course, I'm a little biased, but I think it's the best uh, exhibit that we have at the moment. <laughs> um, but so it features some of my past research. At the moment, my research is really leading into the direction of looking at dung beetles as a model to understand some important biogeographic patterns. So biogeography, that's the field of biology uh, that associates geographic distribution of plants and animals. That's a new word for me, biogeography. I was, I was testing it out. <laughs> and aren't you planning on, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've got a, a big project in the works here that you received a specific grant and you're planning on investigating biogeography using one of our biggest devices in the museum, the planetarium. Is that right? That is correct. So I was recently awarded an NSF career grant 
um, for some of my research. And career grants are really amazing because they focus on integrating a research program with a large educational component. So I love biogeography and I lo love dung beetles. And I really want to share my passion with a broader audience. So I was thinking about the resources and the talented stuff that we have at the museum. And planetariums are literally amazing for not only exploring the universe, but exploring our planet. So I thought it would be an amazing uh, novel way to share biogeography through layering some of that digitized distributional data on the planetarium globe. Um, and NSF took note. And I was really, really lucky to be awarded that, that grant. And I can't wait to share uh, my research and dung beetles un under that dome with everyone. It's a huge project and congratulations on that career grant. Sounds like a, a really big deal. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. <laughs> That's awesome. I wanted to get back to the video for a moment because there was something else that was going on. It was showing animals in our Perkins Wildlife Center and Woods Garden. And I saw a coyote and I saw a bobcat. Uh, what else was in there? Oh, the otters, the otters, the river otters. So when you were working on this project, you used those animals and their dung to attract dung beetles? Yes, so that was for a summer Kirtlandia research internship program where we host uh, different undergrad uh, students to teach them more about science and give them hands-on experience. So again, utilizing the amazing resources at CMNH, I thought, what a better way of spending my summer than looking at food preference of Ohio's native dung beetles. And for me, it was really, really easy to collect a different, a, a wide variety of different food sources because we have the wonderful Perkins Wildlife Ambassadors who donated their different poops to me. So I went out with this uh, research intern, uh, Tammy Starr from Tex Texas A&M, and we set different traps baited with the different animal poop um, and then just waited two, two to three nights to see what different species came to our traps. And then we collected all of the beetles from each of the different traps. They were all labeled and we analyzed it. So this is the most, uh, the slide that was just up was one of the most common uh, species that we have in Ohio. This is called the scooped scarab. And as you can see from that little pie chart there, almost 30% of the specimens, they were collected in the traps baited with coyote poop. Um, but if you compare it to all of the different other baits, this seems to be perhaps a preference. Uh, so this is very preliminary results so far. But then when we looked at different species, also native to here, different species seem to have different preferences. So here is another example, Onthophagus striatulus. And this time, instead of being most attracted to the coyote poop, like the scoop scarabs, almost 30% of them went to mushroom baits, and the other 30%, another 30% of them went to otter poop. So really cool results. And each one of those animals is eating a unique diet. So the otter poop would be, <laughs> not to be super gross, hey, we're talking about poo, right? fishy flavored because <laughs> that's what they eat and then the coyotes are omnivores really so you would have a mixed bag of flavors in there that's fascinating stuff but the mushroom is interesting to me because oops sorry go ahead so different uh species they do have different preferences and it not only relates to the diet of the animal but also the particle size of the poop and the consistency of the poop um so, and then not all dung beetles always feed on dung. They also could in, uh, feed on things like mushrooms, rotting fruit, carrion, which is the carcass of a vertebrate animal or also in an invertebrate animal. Um, so there are alternative food sources. There's a beetle called the carrion beetle that I use in another program that I teach. And the, the little video clip that I have shows a very interesting looking fungus and it's called a stink horn fungus. And it shows these carrion beetles that normally go after dead animals like a dead mouse to feed their larva. And they're crawling all over this mushroom and you can, they almost look, you know, an insect doesn't really have expressions on its face, but they look mighty confused because that stink horn fungus has lured them over with the promise of this delicious smell. And then there's no delicious mouse there. And you had mentioned when we were chatting earlier in the week about another 
another stinky plant that uses this technique? Oh yeah, so I was saying uh, that there are a small number of dung beetles that are also pollinators and they pollinate some of those really stinky lilies, like those corpse lilies that smell like a rotting, dead, stinky, gross stench. Um, and I think it's pretty amazing that dung beetles are also pollinators. Some dung beetles. Man, those guys are doing double duty, triple duty, because they're aerating the soil and they're pollinating. Oh, they're wonderful. I'm, I can see why you are so enamored of dung beetles. Just as a heads up to uh, my social media guru, Sam, out there, and also a tech director and, and show director, Matt, I, unfortunately, my iPad, which I was cleverly trying to double duty here and watch for Facebook questions, no, my, the Wi-Fi here at my house is not going. So if there are some questions coming in from our viewers, uh, feel free to keep typing those folks, and then our, our social media crew will send them over to us. Just a little tech note there. Uh, Dr. Gunter, when we were watching that video as well, you may, I, I have to mention this because this shows dedication to the craft. You tossed in a very quick line where you said, sometimes I make my own. What's that all about? So, so, yes, I make my own bait. Dung beetles are attracted to different types of aromas, um, you know. So you can imagine if you're in the field, you need fresh bait. Uh, and while most of the time we'll be able to find, so I do a lot of field work in Australia, uh, you can find a kangaroo dung pretty easily. And I also will freeze pre-prepared baits like that project but sometimes you just need more bait. And you know what? Everyone poops. <laughs> Boy, that is true. I'm and there's even a children's book. <laughs> that is, that is commit, commitment to your science. I love it. Well, let's see now. I, I know we've been talking about dung beetles because that's your field of research. Um, not every kid on the planet is necessarily going to get into a dung beetle. But maybe if we describe their burrowing process, because you were using the phrase, um, scoop uh, the one beetle was called a scoop it had that has Scooped, that scat. word in its name yeah yeah but don't they use their head like a shovel to kind of is that how they do their digging so their morphology is really um focused so they have the ability to uh, to dig so if you ever have a chance to look at the four tibia so their forearms you'll see that they have a number of teeth along the side edges that help them not only shape that the brood balls, but also dig in the dirt. At the same time, their face uh, generally has a shovel shape to the front of it that also helps them dig these burrows and shape the poop. Um, but what's really cool with dung beetles, a lot of the males will have these cool ornamentations. So either horns on the front of their head or horns or protect projections on the back of their body. And these horns are, um, they're often used to guard the tunnels uh, to stop other males coming in. So they kind of use them to block the tunnel entrance a little bit. Well, once you've gone to all the work of procuring a delicious dung ball, come on, you don't want to be sharing it with all the neighbors coming over. <laughs> now, our, our, our host here, Matt, has typed in a mysterious phrase to me. He has typed in the phrase distribution graphic. Does this uh, mean something super secret to you, Dr. Nicole? Oh, that one. I was. Oh, that one. Yeah. So this is a little <laughs> bit of some of the research that I'll be doing for that NSF grant. I'm really looking at comparing uh, the different geographic patterns of two different groups of Australian dung beetles. So one of the groups of Australian dung beetles, they are have Gondwanan distribution, and they originated prior to the breakup of the main southern continent of. Uh, Gondwana land and eventually Australia. So they those species have been associated with Australia since it was it used to be a large temperate rainforest, um, but then since through time it has aridified and those rainforest patches are usually on the eastern coast. But then at the same time, there's a secondary group of Australian native dung beetles, the Onthophagus, and they colonised Australia approximately 15 million years ago when the continent had drifted northwards enough that it could get some of the fauna coming in from Indomalaya. Um, so those onthophagus successfully colonized the continent and then uh, speciated. And they have a 
different distribution than those Gondwanan species. So I'm looking, I'll be looking at the contribution of evolutionary history to species distribution today. Wow, this is such an intense, there's so, so many layers to the science that you do. I love it. And I've got a pretty intense question here that's been sent to us by our tech crew. You ready? Jim is asking, and I'm going to read this directly. Since this group of beetles has such a stigma around them, he's using the pun again. I love it. Thanks, Jim. Have you found it. a certain approach, uh -huh, a certain approach or phrasing in your educational outreach that is most effective when reaching the general public about why these beetles should be conserved? Well particularly here in Cleveland, I like to try and focus on how dung beetles are important to you, every single person. So think about the number of deer that exist in Ohio across the state. Every single deer poops multiple times per day. And if it wasn't for the cleanup crew like the dung beetles, there would be deer droppings absolutely everywhere. So when you can start to relate about how they affect your day-to-day -day lifestyle, you might begin to think, oh, hey, they're important. But at the same time, generally, the more that people understand uh, about their biology, they start to think, oh, that's neat, instead of that's gross. <laughs> and like you said before, everybody poops. You know, it's, it's life, folks. Adam has a question about, do you study just dung beetles or all different beetles? I mainly just study dung beetles, and that's because there are so many beetles out there that it would be impossible for me to do specific research trying to focus on them all. So another really cool fact is that one in five described animal species on the planet is a beetle. There is over 360,000 species of beetles. And even dung beetles, there are over 6,000 species. That's more dung beetle species than there are mammals. Um, so having a little bit of focus helps me address more specific questions. And yes, I do study dung beetles, but really my specialty is Australian dung beetles. And there are still about 500 species of them. I just like saying one in five animals on the planet is a beetle. That's that's amazing. That is super cool. Me too. <laughs> Another question. And, and yeah, seriously, and a young entomologist would like to know uh, the trap that you and I were discussing at the beginning, the yellow pan trap. Would that be a good uh, science experiment for a young five year old scientist? It definitely would. This is a really, really easy way to observe and engage with nature in your backyard. So different insects are attracted to different colors. So if you have the ability to get a few different colored bowls, uh, ask your parents first, maybe put out a yellow one, maybe put out a white one, a blue one in a, a small area, and then look at the different numbers and the different types of flying insects that come to the different colors. Um, it's a really easy experiment to do at, at home. And is that plain water in that bowl or is, do you add something to it? So it's mostly plain water um, and I don't fill it right up to the top. I leave maybe half a centimeter, quarter of an inch. And then I add one drop of dishwashing detergent. And that detergent is really important because it breaks the water uh, surface tension. So instead of all of the uh, insects landing on the bowl of water and then floating, the the drop of water will make them sink. Wow, that's a sneaky tactic. I like it. And that answers Nancy's question. She was asking if dung beetles can fly. So they fly over to the bowl or the dung. If it was a dung beetle, it could fly as well. Do all beetles fly? So not all beetles fly and not even all dung beetles fly. So most dung beetles can fly, but there are some of them that have lost their wings entirely or some of them that have reduced wings. And normally these ones without wings are found on the top of isolated mountain tops um, or in uh, what we call refugia, so small areas that are restricted to just them. Um, but yes, in general, dung beetles are amazing flyers because he, imagine you're out on the savannah and a zebra 
poops uh, a mile away from you. And right. poop is a pre- pretty abundant uh, but also rare resource. So you've got to be able to detect that scent and then get to it really quickly. So dung beetles have these really cute lamellate antennae. They look like almost little reindeer horns. And now if you see a dung beetle resting, you'll often see them with their antennae segments out. They detect that smell and then they fly as quickly as possible to beat the comp- competition. So they will be trying to beat all of the other dung beetles uh, to that food source. A race to the poo. Did you see what that zebra just did? Let's go. I love that. <laughs> That's a great visual. Do you have any books to recommend if folks are interested in reading up about dung beetles? That was one of the questions that came through. There is actually a, a, a number of uh, dung beetle children's books. Uh, I don't know the titles off the top of my head, but I do have one of them in my office. Um, but there is also an amazing book that was published earlier this year called The Bug Girl. And this was actually about a 12 year old girl who actually wrote the book herself, Sophie, who was being teased for her love of insects. And her mother reached out to some entomologists on Twitter and we all got behind her and encouraged her. Uh, There was a hashtag that trended called bugs are for girls. Uh, And in the end, she ended up writing a beautifully illustrated children's book that was just released. And it's, it's the cutest thing ever. Um, so I really love Bugs for Girl, uh, the Bug Girl. Um, but yeah, there there are some amazing science related yes. children's books out there. I love that. Go girls, find bugs. I love it. Uh, to wrap our interview up, because I just glanced at the time and I realized, oh my gosh, we're keeping you a long time. But a few more questions had come in about local searching for dung beetles. For example, if I find a little pile of of deer poop and I carefully flip it over, am I going to find some dung beetles? Yes. Uh, well, mostly. So I always, <laughs> I make a joke um, that if you come across a pile of poop on your hike in the forest, think of me and think of what would Dr. Nicole Gunter do? What I would do if I was on a hike in the forest and I came across a pile of deer droppings, I would find a short twig, a short stick. Um, So you don't want to be poking the poop with your hands, but if you grab a twig, you can gently break up those pellets of deer droppings. And most of the time, if it's relatively fresh, so still a little bit moist, um, you'll probably find some of those scooped scarab uh, in it. And also things like coyote dung, you'll probably find uh, these little onthophagus beetles in them. They're very small, so maybe about the size of your pinky nail. Uh, they're they're black, um, and I would say they're probably one of the more common beetles in Ohio. But most people don't picture poop like I do. <laughs> I love it. Now, do you want all of these viewers to be rushing out there and collecting these dung beetles and bringing them to you, or do you have enough uh, enough dung beetles from Ohio at the time being? So they're really, really important in the environment. So observe them, appreciate them, and just let them go along their little dung beetle life. So I do a lot of collecting of our native dung beetles on the natural areas preserves. Uh, I do have a beautiful collection of some of our native uh, dung beetles, but I would just say appreciate them, observe them, and then, you know, maybe just let them go. Let them go to move more dung. Well, Dr. Nicole, this has been a extremely fun interview, and I love your sense of humor. And I know that one of your projects in the recent past involved really utilizing that sense of humor in a certain poetic method. Would you care to share with our viewers this ultimate fusion of dung beetles and humor? So after doing that food preference study, I presented some of those results at the Entomological Society of America's conference. Um, And I was trying to encourage my intern that, you know, you want to make your talk memorable. And I was just joking about, you know, the subject matter kind of leaves it leads itself to jokes. Like, what if, you know, you took a super lighthearted approach? And of course, she presented her research in a different way. But when I presented uh it i wrote it as an entire poem rhyming poem 
um, but constructed the presentation as you would a normal presentation, going through the introduction, the materials and methods, results, conclusions, but every single slide had a couple of rhyming couplets. Uh, I didn't tell the audience that I was just going into it blind. I made a little joke that I mainly do Australian native dung beetles. I need some notes because, you know, I'm not that familiar with uh, the Ohio ones. And then I just launched with my, my poem. And I think we have it uh, recorded that we'll probably end this interview with. But I, I always thought that, you know, I want to make my talks memorable. And I got amazing feedback on, on this particular presentation. <laughs> I probably won't do it again. But I hope you enjoy <laughs> Whose Poos Do Ohio's Dung Beetles Choose. I, memorable is the word. You are a memorable human being. And I'm certainly going to remember this opportunity talking with you for a long time. And we are going to let our viewers have the extra bonus footage. I believe this is about uh, six minutes long when we ran it for our test run. So we'll wrap it up with. your time and I wish you much more happy collecting with that yellow pan of yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for watching CMNH at home and now we're gonna have tech guy Matt ready to roll the video. Bye Dr. Gunter and everybody enjoy the video. Hi I'm Dr. Nicole Gunter, Associate Curator of Invertebrate Zoology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. For today's CMNH at Home episode, I'll be sharing a talk I delivered at the 2018 Entomological Society of America's annual conference. I took a lighthearted approach to this talk and delivered it in the style of a Dr. Seuss poem. Whose poos do Ohio's dung beetles choose? These humble creatures live up to their name, feasting on dung without any shame. They use it to feed, they use it to breed, but different species have different needs. They cue into the dung with help of olfaction. Volatile organic compounds lead the attraction. Each VOC profile has its own appeal, luring dung beetles in search of a meal. The ability to feed also has a relation to specialized mouthparts used for large particle filtration. Consistency and substance is really what matters. Some like a crust, some like a splatter. The composition of dung is also significant. The dung of two mammals is not always equivalent. The available hosts influence dung beetle communities, promoting resource partitioning and evolutionary opportunities. And it's not only dung that dung beetles consume. Alternatives include carrion, fruit, and mushroom. Some species are specialists and others don't care. Perhaps it relates to the resources there. Despite dung preference studies being such fun, these ecological surveys are not often done. Existing studies make for such interesting reading, but there's still much to be learned on the biology of feeding. So what better fieldwork than a summer of mapping, dung beetle preference through comparative trapping? This study details feeding in Ohio's northeast. On what mammal poop do our dung beetles feast? Each summer we host a Kirtlandia research intern. The student spends two months in our lab to immersively learn. We recruit undergraduate students from near and afar. This year we selected Texas A&M's Tammy Star. Our museum has a small native animal zoo, which provided our access to fresh mammal poo. With otter, coyote, raccoon and bobcat, each have a different diet, each with different scat. Dung of herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores too, and mushrooms to test dungy's favorite food. Baits were prepared, labeled, and frozen, then a selection of seven was subsequently chosen. Our museum is unique in having a natural areas collection with over 10,000 acres under our protection. To the east, to the south, to Cleveland's west, we surveyed 27 preserves on this dung beetle quest. Baits were randomly spread in a five meter space and mapped to record where each bait was placed. The soil was loosened, the cups in the ground. We'd lure those beetles from the surrounds. The seven choices were given, pitfalls were baited, and for two to three nights, we patiently waited. Contents were emptied from each single trap and labeled to study their favorite crap. One species, two species, three species, four. In six weeks of study, could we collect more? 
Onthophagus, Copris, who would it be? We identified specimens with woodruff and names and price key. 500 beetles mounted on pins, labelled, curated, and sorted to bins. Digitised data from this dung beetle hole assisted in counting their dung baited fall. Combined data shows that numbers weren't equal. Were otter, mushroom, and coyote the favourite of beetles? But what about preference in a single species? Perhaps each would have its own favourite faeces. At 23 sites, Onthophius hecate was caught and the dung of coyote was favourably sought, but normalised data suggests more to this trend. Perhaps with more samples, opossum contends. Onthophagus striatulus was found at most sites, at mushroom and otter, almost equal in rights. But comparing the data when both options were placed, towards otter dung, more striatulus raced. Howden and Cartwright's monograph said, despite mushroom feeding, in dung they still bred. If this was the case, I guess we could test. Did more males come to the dung to provision their nests? Males and females were counted from baits, and most of the time at equivalent rates. More males were trapped with coyote manure, but interpreting these results is a bit premature. Despite limited samples of Orpheus collected, a grey fox preference could not be rejected. And Copris minutus with only a single? He came to Groundhog, hoping to mingle. What about bycatch, aphodius, geotropes, and trox? Did they have a preference for skunk, coyote, or fox? At this point in time, the samples were limited, and significant trends could not be delimited. Before the start of this project, our Ohioan dung beetles were lacking, because no one had made a dedicated effort at dung beetle trapping. We increased our collection by almost eightfold, and gathered the first data on this feeding story untold. This summer's data, assessed with reflection, could be improved with standardised bait selection. This preliminary data still shows some examples of differing trends to explore with more samples. The observational data may not always relate to feeding or breeding or use of the bait. Some records may just be incidental collection of beetles inspecting before further rejection. The survey will continue in subsequent years and include common dung from the white-tailed deer, I'll trap more intensively in a few select preserves to reduce population variation that may be observed. An excellent summer with data galore, some answers, new questions, much more to explore. So what of this question, whose poos do they choose? Guess you'll have to stay tuned to this dung beetle news.